people say that goalies are crazy, we're not, we're just brave. If you drop a clanger, you are an instant internet meme. Without doubt, it's down to cycling that I'm still playing football at my age of 38. A goalie with short sleeve without a base layer is a big no from me. I do not want to see that. Ben Foster, how's it going? I'm good, thanks, mate. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. So uh, we're here to talk about your new film with BT Sport, all about goalkeeping. So my first question is, why did you want to become a goalkeeper? Do you know what? I didn't at first. I really didn't. But I, I've got two older brothers and they kind of just bullied me to go in goal. Like we lived next to the school field. So whenever we went down there, they were outfield players anyway. Um, and they always just ended up putting me in goal and belting balls at me. And I remember so many times crying off and saying like, you're whacking it too hard or it's too cold or it's too wet. Um, and then obviously when I got a bit older, kind of like 12, 13, 14, I had this like growth spurt and everybody was like, well, you're tall. So naturally you should just go and goal. Um, and I was like, yeah, but I love playing left wing and left back and all this kind of stuff. Um, but then once you get to 16, 17, 18, mate, I just realized that I hated running. Like it's not for me. I'm too tall. My knees don't like it. Um, so goalkeeping was the only option. And, and thankfully I've, um, I've managed to nick a living for the last 20 years doing it. I sympathize with your hatred of running, but um i hate going in goal even more so i still Why? what is it though what is it the pressure of it yeah and all, i mean I, I used to go in goal in five aside and try to avoid it at all costs but i sprained my wrist <laughs> like twice yeah, <laughs> yeah it's it's yeah. spraining my wrists because i'm not built for it but you know um, i mean i admire the bravery um, that's why you've got to be a little bit like say people say that goalies are crazy we're not we're just brave that's what it is you've got to be mm. brave you've got to understand that if somebody's four or five yards away and they're going to lever it as out of the come you've got to be happy to spread yourself and take one whether it be in the face in the crown jewels whatever it is as long as you save it and stop it from going in the back of the net it's job done yeah and but i guess you get a massive buzz off that even when you do hurt yourself knowing that the whole team is relying on you in that one moment. Exactly. That's where you hear the roar of the crowd or you'll hear your teammates going, Fuzzy, what a save that. That bit there is like, it's, it's gold. If you could bottle that feeling of that roar and that moment, it's like, it's a lovely feeling, honestly. Um, who was your goalkeeping hero? Um, the big legend, Peter Schmeichel. Um, he was like, but back in the day, he was the main man. He was, it was all about Peter Schmeichel. Um, and he was somebody who I kind of tried to... Um, base my goalkeeping style on really big commanding vocal all that kind of stuff um yeah absolute legend what is the worst thing about being a goalkeeper uh the worst thing is knowing that if you make a mistake then you are going to be letting your teammates down and that's the worst feeling that is where the pressure comes from um like I say, you, you know that if, you, if you're if you playing on a Sunday afternoon and you're playing one of the big boys, Liverpool, Man City, Man U, there could be in excess of half a billion people watching you on telly at that moment in time. So if you drop a clanger, you are an instant internet meme. Like people are making videos, mock-ups of it, gifts, all sorts, straight away. So you that's always kind of, it's incredible, but it does always just kind of tick away at the back of the head. You've got to let that go a little bit. The, but the worst feeling is knowing that you've let your teammates down. Even though you haven't meant to, it's it's inevitable. And even though they probably don't act as if it's all your fault, that you can't help but feel that way, right? In that, oh, sometimes in they do. They're dickheads. Outfield players are dickheads. <laughs> like, they're, they're more than happy to turn around and do the flinging of the arms and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, they love um, it. As long as they, the tension's away from them, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was going to be one of my later questions, actually, about how goalkeepers' mistakes are always more scrutinised than say like if a midfielder loses ball in the middle of the pitch. So how do you cope with that added pressure of being in such a sort of lonely position? Yeah, it's a psychology. Honestly, it's the psychology of it that I think all goalkeepers have to have done some sort of training um, to deal with the, the expectation, the pressure um, and dealing with mistakes as well. What to do with it? Do you let it linger? Do you carry on the game that way? Or are you able to just get rid of it, stick it in the recycling bin and move on? Um, it's something I've only learned to do, do, do as I've gotten older, as a, as a person and as a footballer. Um, but I do think that working on the psychological side of football is just as important as working on the gym side of it or the technical or the tactical, all that side. Of it. It's another massive part of your game that you need to really need to work on. And what's the best thing about being a goalkeeper? Um, the best thing about being a goalie is you haven't got to run around so much and the goalies union is normally a wicked group of human beings who have a lovely time together and we just talk about like latex on our gloves and catching stuff or did you see the save on telly the other night or that kind of stuff yeah it's wicked
it almost is like you're, I mean, you are kind of playing a different sport to everybody else on the pitch. So yeah, I can, can imagine. It is. It's an um, individual position within a team. Yeah, um, mm. but I still, I'd rather, much rather be doing that with all the added pressure that's attached to it and stuff than than being outfield player for sure. On that, on that fitness note about um, not having to run around too much in pre-season, do you still get made to do all the same endurance stuff as the outfield players, or do you get a little bit of an easier July? Oh, we get a much easier time, mate. We don't need to like we as long as we're as long as our body fat's like semi-low and um, we're still in reasonable shape. You don't need to be able to run as a goalkeeper. Um, I'm. I, I say I'm fortunate, but it's pr- probably a bad, bad thing at the same time. I've had a lot of knee injuries, so I've had three cruciate reconstructions in my knees before. So from the age of about 30, I haven't been able to run. So, like, I will just do gym work. That's why I do a lot of cycling, obviously. So I do so much cycling because, it one, it keeps the weight off, keeps the body fat down, um, allows me to eat and drink whatever I want pretty much. But also the most important part is that it keeps all the little moving parts strong, all the tiny little muscles that you need to be a footballer to stop and twist and turn, all that kind of stuff. It keeps it all strong. So without doubt, it's down to cycling that I'm still playing football at my age of 38. Not to get too into the... um physiological elements of it but cycling is better for your knees than running right because it doesn't have the impact as well exactly so. that exactly that and you get to wear like wicked lycra and you look incredible um so yeah it's, a, it's i a- don't know if i'd look that good in the lycra <laughs> but fair enough um what is the best performance you've ever put in as a goalkeeper um the best individual performance was um probably against chelsea when i was at birmingham city we beat them one nil at home at st andrews um, I think they had something like 13 shots on target, 25 shots in total. Um, and we, we, we won with a stinky little Lebo, your goal, our only shot on target, scored it, and we hung on for dear life. And that was an incredible feeling. I've had a few, to be fair, the League Cup final against Arsenal, where we beat them uh, 2-1. Um, that was a pretty good game, got one of the match in the final. So that was a nice feeling. But yeah, probably the, uh, the Birmingham against Chelsea game. Those are always the most satisfying wins as well. Um, what is the most embarrassing moment you've ever had on the pitch um embarrassing um it's got to be when Paul Robertson scored past me like when another goalie scores past you it's never a nice feeling um bearing in mind he was about honestly like he was on the corner of his 18 yard box for god's sake like and he's just absolutely munted it um (laughs) big Dan Shitu the centre back in front of me kind of went to head it and then he kind of ducked out of it the last moment and it took a, an awful bounce. I'm blaming everything else other than me, by the way. Can you not? Can you gauge that? Um, but yeah, that weren't a nice feeling. You know, like I say, you know, as soon as that ball goes over you, I'm almost glad that that was like 15 years ago. Because if that was today, like I say, you've got probably a couple billion people will be seeing that on the internet within minutes. Within minutes, you're the biggest meme of everything. Everybody's talking about it. Um, yeah, it's not a nice feeling. No. Uh, did you talk to Paul Robinson after that goal? Yeah, because we were with England. We were joining up with England literally yeah. after the game. So um, <laughs> at that moment in time, it was like a bit up in the air as to who was going to be England's number one. It was almost like they were billing it before the the um, the game because I was on loan at Watford at the time. They were billing it as like the the head-to-head of the goalkeepers to see who's going to be England's number one. And then he went and scored. So decision was made, basically. So yeah, he he inevitably he played uh, the next game for England after that. <laughs> And you know, he, he was sweet though. He didn't take the mick too much, honestly. He didn't take the mick too much. Goalkeepers in short sleeves, yes or no? Uh, I wear short sleeves, but I will wear like, um, like an under armor, like a base layer underneath it. I always wear short sleeves, so even so now, like. What, the, what, what our kit man does for me, he basically gets them all tailored at the beginning of the season. He'll get like 30 shirts or whatever and he will get them so they look like a T-shirt. He'll get them cut off and then a tailor lady or a man or whatever it is will do it properly so it's all done nicely. Um, but yeah, I wear, a, I wear a thing. But if a goalie with short sleeves without a base layer is a big no from me. I do not want to see that. Is that purely aesthetics or like comfort? Because I, I think one of the first to do it must have been like Casillas and then you get the likes of uh, Chesney doing it. It's quite a modern thing, but is it yeah. just because it looks weird? That you don't uh, like it's, it? it's funny enough, I made my England debut against Spain and Casillas was playing for Spain and he played in that short sleeve shirt like you're on about there. I'd let Casillas slide because he's a frigging legend. That guy can do whatever he wants. But I got his shirt after the game and he has literally cut it. So you can see the zigzag, oh. like scissor marks from where he's cut it. Um, but So he can do what he wants. But yeah, it is purely an aesthetic thing. It's a, it's like a peacocking. It's like, look at me, I look so cool. They've probably got tattoos down their arms and stuff like that. And they think they're the man or something. But no, nah, not for me. It is, it is a bit like wearing pink boots, I think. Yeah, exactly. Um, they probably have got pink boots on as well. <laughs> 
you've played a million games as a professional player across a very long career, but obviously in some squads you've been first choice, in some squads you've been backup. Normally in the England squad you've been maybe second or third. Being a goalkeeper seems lonely as it is. How much, how different is it to be like a substitute keeper knowing that you are there in a supporting role? Yeah, it's, it's there's a lot of different situations there. So, for example, when um, when I was at Man United and I'm second choice behind Edwin van der Sar, there's you you can't go banging on the manager's door and thinking I should be playing here because it's Edwin van der Sar, he's a frigging legend. So what you have to do is you have to get into a cheerleader role and you have to try and support him as much as you can. So on a Wednesday, Thursday, you'd be like, mate, you go in and I'll do the shooting practice. You know what I mean? Don't worry about it, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then obviously if you feel, if you're second choice and you feel like you should be the number one goalkeeper, you can't, you can't get upset about it. You can't get like down about it because that means then you probably won't try as hard. You won't work as hard in training. You'll be miserable around the place. You always have to keep yourself going. You have to like motivation is massive when you're in that situation. You have to work even harder. You know, there, there was a physio at Man United used to say to me that if you're not in the first team, you have to be working harder than the person in your position. And that's how I look at it. You have to work harder and show that you're better. And inevitably, if you keep doing it, you'll get put in the team. I mean, even when you were back up at Man United, you got a couple of massive games and you two League Cup finals back to back, I think. Yeah, I, and... played, I played in the first one. Uh, Thomas Kusha I played in the second one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, but the the am I, am I remembering this correctly? Because it was about 13 years ago now. Did you... Um, when it went to penalties against Tottenham, yep. Did you show? Did you have like an iPod touch with videos of them of the Tottenham players and how they took their pens? So yeah, that seemed quite new at the time. Yeah, oh, it, was, iPad, that, right, it okay. was massive news. Like it was massive. Like oh my god, football's so evolved because look at him. He's looking at an iPad. Like literally everybody was doing it at that moment in time. It's just that when it got to a penalty shootout, the cameras actually caught it. Um, and it was, it was huge news of like, oh my God, look how like they're so technologically advanced to everybody else in the world. Cause he's, it, but literally everybody was doing it to be put. It's basically the same as having a piece of paper in your sock, which says he goes left, he goes right, he goes left, but I've just got it in front of me and actually doing it. Um, so it was made to be much more than it actually was. <laughs> um, uh, and did you follow all of the sort of advice that you've taken from that data on the iPad? Did you go the same way or... No, I think what they're they're not they're they're never definite. Honestly, they're not. Even now, like we look at look at penalty takers and we'll look at what they might do, and you can try and study their body shape or little things they might do to that might be a tell, there might be a little giveaway that they might go a certain way. Um, so you can study it as much as you want, but I think at the end of the day, you still have to go with your gut instinct. You know, you have to use a little bit of your own nous to think right. He's looked in that corner. He's positioned the ball. I'm going to go this way, and sometimes it's the best way to do it. I mean, one of the players who takes pens in a quite unique way at the moment is Jorginho, obviously. He seems to let keepers lean one way and then go the other. And just going back to what you were saying about the goalkeepers' union earlier, watching Pickford save his penalty in that shootout, you all must have been extra buzzing for, for Pickford because he kind of called his bluff, didn't he? Exactly that. Yeah, it's a brave thing to do because you've got to stand there. And the longer you stand there, if, if he's literally, it has to get to the point where Jorginho puts his head down and he's no longer looking at the goalkeeper. So the moment he puts his head down, that's when you can start to dive. But you know that from him looking down and about to kick the ball, from that moment of him kicking it to getting to the ball, reaching the goal line, it's probably less than a second, yeah? It's less than a second. So you have to be very quick. You have to be a rapid goalie to be able to make that save. And it was a banging save from Pickford as well because it was right in the corner and he just about got it, tipped it onto the post and kept it out. It was, well, I remember watching it. I was actually in the stadium watching it. Mate, did I jump out so hot. It was incredible. Like that, it's, that fe it's almost like I had made the save. I, could, I got the same sort of feeling. It was wicked. Yeah, I uh, I was I thought that I thought we'd won it anyway. We I know. Go back I know. How important is it for you for well for footballers, especially goalkeepers, given what we've established about the position, to have that kind of passion outside of football? Yeah, it's. Um, I think the problem with football is that it's it seems to be like so all consuming and the most important thing in the world, and that that therein lies the problem. I think because players then go and identify themselves as footballers. You know, they're not footballers, they're human beings. You know, they've got a life, they've got a family, they might have a wife, kids, mother, father, sister, brothers, all that kind of stuff. And I think that has to be your first priority. You have to have other interests outside of football. You can't walk around saying you're a footballer all the time because you're not just a footballer. Um, so then 
like you say, if you if you identify as a footballer, if you have a bad game on a Saturday afternoon, you will carry that with you all week long. That will live with you and you'll take it home and you'll take it out on your family and all that kind of stuff. And you can't do that. You know, you can't live your life like that. That's why you see a lot of players after football struggle, really struggle mentally and motivation to do stuff because they've lived their life as a footballer. You can't do that. You have to have other interests in life. So yeah, for me, like I say, I've got the cycling, I've got the YouTube channel. These are the bits and bobs I'm interested in. And People sometimes they don't like it because they think I should just be fully committed to football. If I lose a game on a Saturday afternoon, I should be going home and crying. And it couldn't be further from the truth. The quicker you can get it out of your brain and get it out of your system, the more the quicker you can move on. You have received a little bit of criticism for your extracurricular activities, the YouTube videos that you do about being a cycling goalkeeper. Um, what's your, and you know the accusation that because you do that, you're not focused enough on your football? What would be your response to people who say that? Yeah, that's listen, everybody is fully entitled to their opinion. And, you know, that's exactly the beauty of, of football in general is most people do have an opinion as well. Um, but no, for me, it's it's I need that distraction. I have to have that distraction. You know, even in games, for example, I can't fully focus on what's going on in front of me all the time. I will be singing a song. I'll be thinking about this and that going on later on tonight or tomorrow or something, because if you fully get embroiled in it all the time, it rules your life and it can ruin your life as well. So for me, no. Now, as soon as as soon as the match is done on a Saturday afternoon, I have got it out of my head already. Whether I've had the best game in the world or the worst game in the world, I will constantly just stay on an even keel. And I'd, I'd say every football out there should do exactly the same sort of thing. And no, I think you need other avenues. You have to have other, have, 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 have other avenues outside of football because it can just consume you otherwise.